This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Crowther. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 38. On Saturday morning, Elizabeth and Mr. Collins met for breakfast a few minutes before the others appeared and he took the opportunity of paying the parting civilities which he deemed indispensably necessary. "'I know not, Miss Elizabeth,' said he, "'whether Mrs. Collins has yet expressed her sense of your kindness in coming to us, but I am very certain you will not leave the house without receiving her thanks for it. The favour of your company has been much felt, I assure you. We know how little there is to tempt any one in our humble abode, our plain manner of living, our small rooms, and few domestics, and the little we see of the world, must make Hunsford extremely dull to a young lady like yourself, but I hope you will believe us grateful for the condescension, and that we have done everything in our power to prevent your spending your time unpleasantly. Elizabeth was eager with her thanks and assurances of happiness. She had spent six weeks with great enjoyment, and the pleasure of being with Charlotte and the kind attentions she had received must make her feel the obliged. Mr. Collins was gratified, and with more smiling solemnity replied, It gives me great pleasure to hear that you have passed your time not disagreeably. We have certainly done our best, and most fortunately having it in our power to introduce you to very superior society, and from our connections with Rosings, the frequent means of varying the humble home scene, I think we may flatter ourselves that your Hunsford visit cannot have been entirely irksome. Our situation with regard to Lady Catherine's family is indeed the sort of extraordinary advantage and blessing which few can boast. You see on what a footing we are. You see how continually we are engaged there. In truth, I must acknowledge that with all the disadvantages of this humble parsonage, I should not think any one abiding in it an object of compassion while they are sharers of our intimacy at Rosings. Words were insufficient for the elevation of his feelings, and he was obliged to walk about the room while Elizabeth tried to unite civility and truth in a few short sentences. "'You may, in fact, carry a very favourable report of us into Hertfordshire, my dear cousin. I flatter myself, at least, that you will be able to do so. Lady Catherine's great attentions to Mrs. Collins you have been a daily witness of, and altogether I trust it does not appear that your friend has drawn an unfortunate, but on this point it will be as well to be silent. Only let me assure you, my dear Elizabeth, that I can from my heart most cordially wish you equal felicity in marriage. My dear Charlotte and I have but one mind and one way of thinking— there is in everything a most remarkable resemblance of character and ideas between us. We seem to have been designed for each other. Elizabeth could safely say that it was a great happiness where that was the case, and with equal sincerity could add that she firmly believed and rejoiced in his domestic comforts. She was not sorry, however, to have the recital of them interrupted by the lady from whom they sprang. Poor Charlotte! It was melancholy to leave her to such society. But she had chosen it with her eyes open, and though evidently regretting that her visitors were to go, she did not seem to ask for compassion. Her home and her housekeeping, her parish and her poultry, and all their dependent concerns had not yet lost their charms. At length the chaise arrived, the trunks were fastened on, the parcels placed within, and it was pronounced to be ready. After an affectionate parting between the friends, Elizabeth was attended to the carriage by Mr. Collins, and as they walked down the garden he was commissioning her with his best respects to all her family, not forgetting his thanks for the kindness he had received at Longburn in the winter, and his compliments to Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner, though unknown. He then handed her in, 
Mariah followed, and the door was on the point of being closed when he suddenly reminded them, with some consternation, that they had hitherto forgotten to leave any messages for the ladies at Rosings. But, he added, you will of course wish to have your humble respects delivered to them, with your grateful thanks for their kindness to you while you have been here. Elizabeth made no objection. The door was then allowed to be shut, and the carriage drove off. "'Good gracious!' cried Maria, after a few minutes' silence. "'It seems but a day or two since we first came, and yet how many things have happened!' "'A great many, indeed,' said her companion with a sigh. "'We have dined nine times at Rosings, besides drinking tea there twice. How much I shall have to tell!' Elizabeth added privately and how much I shall have to conceal. Their journey was performed without much conversation or any alarm, and within four hours of their leaving Hunsford they reached Mr. Gardiner's house, where they were to remain a few days. Jane looked well, and Elizabeth had little opportunity of studying her spirits amidst the various engagements which the kindness of her aunt had reserved for them. But Jane was to go home with her, and at Longbourn there would be leisure enough for observation. It was not without an effort, meanwhile, that she could wait even for Longbourn, before she told her sister of Mr. Darcy's proposals. To know that she had the power of revealing what would so exceedingly astonish Jane, and must at the same time so highly gratify whatever of her own vanity she had not yet been able to reason away, was such a temptation to openness as nothing could have been conquered but the state of indecision in which she remained as to the extent of what she should communicate, and her fear, if she once entered on the subject, of being hurried into repeating something of Bingley which might only grieve her sister further. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 it was the second week in May in which the three young ladies set out together from Gracechurch Street for the town in Hertfordshire, and as they drew near the approved inn where Mr. Bennet's carriage was to meet them, they quickly perceived, in token of the coachman's punctuality, both Kitty and Lydia looking out of a dining-room upstairs. These two girls had been above an hour in the place, happily employed in visiting an opposite milliner, watching the sentinel on guard, and dressing a salad and cucumber. After welcoming their sisters, they triumphantly displayed a table set out with such cold meat as an inn larder usually affords, exclaiming, Is this not nice? Is not this an agreeable surprise? And we mean to treat you all, added Lydia, but you must lend us the money, for we have just spent ours at the shop out there. Then, showing her purchases, Look here, I have bought this bonnet. I do not think it is very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as not. I shall pull it to pieces as soon as I get home, and see if I can make it up any better. And when her sisters abused it as ugly, she added with perfect unconcern, Oh, but there were two or three much uglier in the shop, and when I have bought some prettier colored satin to trim it with, fresh, I think it will be very tolerable. Besides, it will not much signify what one wears this summer, after the militia have left Meryton, and they are going in a fortnight. Are they indeed, cried Elizabeth, with great satisfaction. They are going to be encamped near Brighton, and I do so want Papa to take us there for the summer. It would be such a delicious scheme, and I dare say would cost hardly anything at all. Mamma would like to go too, of all things. Only think what a miserable summer else we shall have. Yes, thought Elizabeth, that would be a delightful scheme indeed, and completely do for us at once. Good heaven! Brighton and a whole campful of soldiers? To us who have been overset already by one poor regiment of militia and the monthly balls of Meryton. Now I have got some news for you, said Lydia, as they sat down at the table. What do you think? It is excellent news, capital news, and about a certain person we all like. Jane and Elizabeth looked at each other, and the waiter was told he need not stay. Lydia laughed and said, 
Ay, that is just like your formality and discretion. You thought the waiter must not hear as if he cared. I dared say he often hears worse things said than what I am going to say. But he is an ugly fellow. I am glad he is gone. I never saw such a long chin in my life. Well, but now for my news. It is about dear Wickham. Too good for the waiter, is it not? There is no danger of Wickham's marrying Mary King. There's for you. She is gone down to her uncle at Liverpool, gone to stay. Wickham is safe. And Mary King is safe, added Elizabeth, safe from a connection imprudent as to fortune. She is a great fool for going away if she liked him. But I am sure there is no strong attachment on either side, said Jane. I am sure there is not on his. I will answer for it. He never cared three straws about her. Who could about such a nasty little freckled thing? Elizabeth was shocked to think that, however incapable of such coarseness of expression herself, the coarseness of the sentiment was little other than her own breast had harbored and fancied liberal. As soon as all had ate, and the elder ones paid, the carriage was ordered, and after some contrivance the whole party, with all their boxes, work-bags, and parcels, and the unwelcome addition of Kitty's and Lydia's purchases, were seated in it. "'How nicely we are all crammed in!' cried Lydia. "'I am glad I bought my bonnet, if it is only for the fun of having another bandbox. "'Well, now, let us be quite comfortable and snug, and talk and laugh all the way home. "'And in the first place, let us hear what has happened to you all since you went away. "'Have you seen any pleasant men? Have you had any flirting? "'I was in great hopes that one of you would have got a husband before you came back.' Jane will be quite an old maid soon, I declare. She is almost twenty-three. Lord, how ashamed I should be of not being married before twenty and three. My Aunt Phillips wants you so to get husbands. You can't think. She says Lizzie had better have taken Mr. Collins, and I do not think there would have been any fun in it. Lord, how I should like to be married before any of you, and then I would chaperone you about to all the balls. Dear me, we had such a good piece of fun the other day at Colonel Foster's. Kitty and me were to spend the day there, and Mrs. Foster promised to have a little dance in the evening. By the by, Mrs. Foster and me are such friends. And so she asked the two Harringtons to come, but Harriet was ill, and so Penn was forced to come by herself, and then what do you think we did? We dressed up chamberlains in women's clothes on purpose to pass for a lady. Only think what fun! Not a soul knew of it but Colonel and Mrs. Foster and Kitty and me, except my aunt, for we were forced to borrow one of her gowns, and you could not imagine how well he looked. When Denny and Wickham and Pratt and two or three more of the men came in, they did not know him in the least. Lord, how I laughed! And so did Mrs. Foster. I thought I should have died. And that made the men suspect something, and then they soon found out what was the matter. With such kinds of histories of their parties and good jokes, did Lydia, assisted by Kitty's hints and additions, endeavor to amuse her companions all the way to Longbourn. Elizabeth listened as little as she could, but there was no escaping the frequent mention of Wickham's name. The reception at home was most kind. Mrs. Bennet rejoiced to see Jane in undiminished beauty, and more than once during dinner did Mr. Bennet say voluntary to Elizabeth, I am glad you are back, Lizzie. Their party in the dining room was large, for almost all the Lucases came to meet Maria and hear the news, and various were the subjects that occupied them. Lady Lucas was inquiring of Maria after the welfare and poultry of her eldest daughter. Mrs. Bennet was doubly engaged, on one hand collecting an account of the present fashions from Jane, who sat way below her, and on the other retailing them all to the younger Lucases. And Lydia, in a voice louder than any other person's, was enumerating the various pleasures of the morning to anybody who would hear her. "'Oh, Mary,' said she, "'I wish you had gone with us, for we had such fun. 
As we went along, Kitty and I drew up the blinds and pretended there was nobody in the coach, and I should have gone so all the way if Kitty had not been sick, and when we got to the George I do think we behaved very handsomely, for we treated the other three with the nicest cold luncheon in the world, and you, if you would have gone, we would have treated you too, and then when we came away it was such fun. I thought we never should have got into the coach. I was ready to die of laughter. And then we were so merry all the way home. We talked and laughed so loud that anybody might have heard us ten miles off. To this Mary very gravely replied, Far be it from me, my dear sister, to depreciate such pleasures. They would doubtless be congenial with the generality of female minds, but I confess they would have no charms for me. I should infinitely prefer a book. But all of this answer Lydia heard not a word. She seldom listened to anybody for more than half a minute, and never attended to Mary at all. In the afternoon Lydia was urgent with the rest of the girls to walk to Meryton and to see how everybody went on. But Elizabeth steadily opposed the scheme. It should not be said that the Miss Bennets could not be home half a day before they were in pursuit of the officers. There was another reason, too, for her opposition. She dreaded seeing Mr. Wickham again, and was resolved to avoid it as long as possible. The comfort to her of the regiment's approaching removal was indeed beyond expression. In a fortnight they were to go, and once gone she hoped there could be nothing more to plague her on his account. She had not been many hours at home before she found that the Brighton scheme, of which Lydia had given them a hint at the inn, was under frequent discussion between her parents. Elizabeth saw directly that her father had not the smallest intention of yielding, but his answers were at the same time so vague and equivocal that her mother, though often disheartened, had never yet despaired of succeeding at the last. End of chapter 39